very much. Um, thanks for coming. I hope you've all survived the heat. Uh, and uh, fortunately, we still seem to have some air conditioning here. Uh, I'm very happy to have Phil, who will uh, talk to us about human rights in the Mekong area. Yeah. And he's been with Human Rights Watch for a long time. Uh, he's worked, worked with the FLCIOs, uh, human rights organizations as well. Um, and he's been a resident of Thailand for 16 years. So he knows the region extremely well. And uh, without further ado, the floor is his. He'll speak for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have our usual discussion in Q&A. If you can get an invitation directly, just uh, give me your um, Meishi, or you can put it in the box, and also boxes where you can put a contribution to our institute so you get even more programs. So thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you very much for that. Uh, first of all, I appreciate you inviting me here and uh, having an opportunity to talk about the, the things I do day in and day out, which is uh, work on human rights in the Mekong subregion. Um, I want to thank Temple uh, Japan campus for, for inviting us for involving Human Rights Watch in your programs. Uh, uh, I'm Phil Robertson, and uh, I'm the deputy director for the Asia division of Human Rights Watch. I'm based in Bangkok, as you heard, and I actually cover not only the countries we're talking about, but also a number of others, including North Korea and Japan. So uh, I do often get the chance to come to Japan, and it's a great chance to uh, be here and talk to you today. Um, uh, I guess when I was thinking about starting this discussion, I wanted to think about how I would try to tie it all together. And I guess when I look at Southeast Asian affairs, uh, particularly in the Mekong, I, I would say that one thing that we can say that's changed in the past several years is uh, the new revel relevance of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Um, and ASEAN, as you may know, is aiming for uh, full economic integration uh, by 2015. Uh, this is now actually getting much more attention in the different capitals of the Southeast Asian countries, uh, especially after the ASEAN Charter was adopted in November 2007. And then, of course, the creation of these three ASEAN communities, political security, economic and sociocultural, and uh, a set of blueprints that would take the work forward to this integration experiment, I would say, for, for ASEAN. Um, that new ASEAN Charter, uh, made ASEAN a legally binding com uh, community, a legally bound commitment to work together. It's very interesting that ASEAN operated from 1967 until 2007, 40 years, without a formal treaty to, to, to hold them together, without a, without a formal uh, charter. Uh, now that it has been adopted, uh, as you go through it, you find that there's a lot of inherent con contradictions. And those contradictions actually arise from disagreements that come up in ASEAN that are not resolved, but in ASEAN fashion, sort of papered over. A lot of speeches, particularly by the uh, current Secretary General of ASEAN, Sir Richard Tsawan Thai, proclaim a new ASEAN, proclaim a golden future for the region. But four years on, I would argue that uh, what what remains and what what is what is hard to dismiss is that there's still an old ASEAN way uh, of pursuing things. And that old ASEAN way is when one, one government objects, everything comes to a stop. So there's a, there's a great deal of comfort still within AS, with, with ASEAN among some of the, the countries that we're going to be talking about today. That if they don't like what's happening, they can stop everything, they can change the subject, they can change the channel, and the organization will follow them. So while on one hand, uh, the core principles of ASEAN that are laid out in the Charter include, in section 2.1, I'll quote here, quote, respect for fundamental freedoms, the promotion and protection of human rights, and the promotion of social justice. Sounds very good. Sounds something Human Rights Watch would support. And section 2H, quote, adherence to rule of law, good governance, the principles democracy and constitutional government, Again, something we think is, sounds quite good. Right next to it are other provisions that allow for, for 
uh, states like Burma, or Myanmar, uh, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, which are human rights abuses, to get out of those commitments. Um, Section 2E of the ASEAN Charter, and this is looking at the core principles of what ASEAN does, establishes the principle of, quote, non-interference in the internal affairs of ASEAN member states, unquote, very familiar. 2F, quote, the respect for the right of every member state to lead its national existence free from external interference, subversion, and coercion. Essentially setting out that uh, no one outside the national entity can force a state to do anything. Uh, in, in some ways, uh, uh, an almost basic denial of uh, international treaties, such as the International Human Rights Treaties that Human Rights Watch works with every day. So when we had an ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, or ITER, set up with much fanfare by ASEAN, um, what we found is you get into the details of these, these mechanisms. ITER, there was no guarantee for independent commissioners. There's a mandate that doesn't include the ability for this commission to receive complaints, which left a lot of us scratching our heads. I mean, when you think about uh, a human rights commission, what is the first thing you think of? The first thing I think of is that that is a place where you can, uh, if you have a grievance, you have a complaint, you can go and file a complaint there, and that they will investigate and look at it. <laughs> well, this ASEAN Inter Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights doesn't even have that right. They're not allowed a role uh, in protection of human rights. They talk about promotion, but the issue of promotion uh, that I think that the people were uh, involved in establishing the ITER in, in, in pursuit of the uh, ASEAN Charter, I think I have an idea of like maybe teaching children about human rights, you know, something about classrooms, uh, something about you know maybe this will take take effect in 30, 40 years but not really anything focused on what we would consider to be meaningful human rights uh, action. And, of course, not enough budget, no independent secretariat, basically little ability to function. Other, other instruments that we've seen at ASEAN are the same way. Um, the ASEAN Commission for the Protection and Promotion of Rights of Women and Children uh, doesn't function well. There's a draft regional agreement to protect the rights of migrant workers, this is called for in an ASEAN Declaration for the Protection and Promotion of the Rights of Migrant Workers. That's also going nowhere. Um, there's even now uh, a new initiative uh, from the ASEAN to draft what is going to be called an ASEAN Declaration on Human Rights. Uh, this will be in time for adoption by ASEAN next year. But sadly, rather than being a cause for celebration, because you know, ideally as an organization that promotes human rights, Human Rights Watch would like to be able to say, Yes, we want you to uh, state what you're going to do on human rights. We're, we're actually quite concerned because as, as far as we can see it, there's three possibilities for that ASEAN declaration. One, a declaration that exceeds international human rights standards, which we don't expect. Uh, second, a declaration that meets international standards, which begs the question of why have it? You already have the international human rights standards. Why don't you just ratify the rel relevant conventions? or something that's going to be less than international human rights standards. And um, judging by the tone of some of the ASEAN member governments, and this gets where into the Mekong issue right, directly, I suspect that actually some of them are still harboring the illusion that there is another separate standard for rights that is possible in ASEAN. And that you know some of what we call the new members, not the original group that joined, but uh, what we call CLMV, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam, uh, are looking to pick up the long discredited cause of what was known as Asian values, which was a, uh, a theory that was promoted by people like Lee Kuan Yew and Mohammed Mahathir in the 90s, and ultimately uh, discredited, that effectively argues against the universality and indivisibility of human rights. Why is, it, why is it coming to this? Why is this situation coming up like this? Well, I would argue to you that the, the new members of ASEAN, the so-called CLMV group, are not on board with human rights issues. And, and when they go into regional integration, we're going to see a very, very significant divide between countries like Philippines, Indonesia, to a lesser extent perhaps Thailand, and others who are moving forward on human rights 
and this, this lagger group that is actually, I think, pulling backwards. And the question, what does it mean for regional integration? What does it mean for, for standards in the region? Um, given the recent internal political turmoil in Thailand, that's really affected the country since about 2006. Uh, and more recently, uh, the armed conflicts with Cambodia over the Frey Vihir Temple and the, the Thai-Cambodian border. Um, I would argue that what was formerly the case, that Thailand was the leading member of the Mekong subregion within this group, they've been effectively displaced by Vietnam. Um, and on human rights issues, particularly on human rights issues of human rights and democracy, the CLMV states are, are taking their lead from Hanoi, not from Bangkok. Um, Vietnam had a successful but highly restrictive chairmanship of ASEAN in 2010, which showed other states how to rein in civil society organizations, for instance, those meeting the ASEAN People's Forum, uh, while refusing also to hold what was called the so-called interface meetings between the ASEAN NGOs, the ASEAN leaders that had been started under Thailand's uh, ASEAN chairmanship. That first Thailand meeting where you had uh, a representative of civil society from the ASEAN countries meeting with the leaders of the uh, Southeast Asian nations, including uh, joined by the Secretary General, happened in Hua Hin, and it ended up actually being boycotted by the leaders of Burma and Cambodia. Uh, that was then followed further by Thailand's huge embarrassment uh, in April 2009. You may have seen this on the, on the TV when uh, uh, UDD, the uh, red shirts uh, in Thailand, stormed the Pattaya Hotel where they were holding the ASEAN summit, uh, forcing a number of the ASEAN leaders to flee by helicopter and causing a huge black eye for, for Thailand. Um, <clears throat> Don't get me wrong, I don't think that Thailand's neighbors are going to be in a position to overtake Thailand anytime soon in terms of their economy, the size of the economy. I mean, Thailand's economy dwarfs its neighbors. Uh, Thailand will remain the logistics and economics hub of the region for the foreseeable future. But what is clear is that none of Thailand's neighbors are prepared to follow Thailand in terms of uh, relatively greater respect for human rights such as freedom of association, expression of peaceful assembly, or civil participation in the electoral, electoral democracy that we saw on display yesterday in Thailand. I'll talk about that a little bit later, what that election means. Um, in fact, I would argue, looking now again specifics, when we look at Thailand's human rights record, uh, I actually see more bad influences coming from, from Thailand's neighbors into Thailand, uh, where political uh, instability has caused Thailand to compromise on human rights, especially for uh, non-Thais, in exchange for political and economic advantage. Um, I mean, Thailand does a lot of things wrong on its own to its own people, but uh, what we saw, for instance, I started working with Human Rights Watch in December 2009, the first thing I had to work on uh, was the mass force back, the refoulement of uh, the Lao Mong, in December 2009, back to Laos, where the Thai army was uh, putting people onto trucks and trucking them across the border. These people were not only uh, persons with refugee status granted by UNHCR, but also, in a number of cases, people who had already been granted a third country, country resettlement, uh, the US, Canada, the Netherlands, or Australia. And they were also sent back, along with much larger group who were presenting uh, refugee claims but were not allowed to have access to UNHCR and therefore were never, never, never screened. Why did they do that? Well, at that time, that was the period when uh, former Prime Minister Thaksin had reached very close relationships with Hun Sen, had been uh, essentially appointed as an economic advisor to the Cambodian government. And the Thai army wanted to make sure that Laos stayed on side. And the, and the price for the Lao was, okay, you've got to give us back the Mong. You have to end fully and completely, and finally, to our own satisfaction, uh, our suspicion over the years that the Thai army has used the Lao Mong to destabilize Laos, which is true, they had And so uh, these people were sent back over the objections of the UN Secretary General, 
over the objections of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, over the objections of the uh, head of UNHCR, and many other world leaders. Uh, on the Thai Burma border, we're looking at, well, there's a new project. Uh, it's going to be a massive project, uh, 80 billion US dollars, um, uh, set up at Da Wei, which is in, uh, in, in Da Wei, to establish a deep water port, major industrial estates, and a road, road, rail, gas pipeline link from Burma to Thailand. Uh, when Prime Minister Apisit was here in uh, for the APEC meetings in Japan, he was talking this up with the Chinese and Japanese governments. Um, what it will do is it will make it possible to bring cargo from the Anaman Sea, from, from basically from the Middle East, from Saudi Arabia, instead of having to go down through the Malacca Straits and around Singapore and up through the Gulf of Thailand, you'll be able to come into a deep water point in the way in one of the, the sort of thin parts of Burma where it stretches down, and they will set up that road rail link, uh, a total of about 300 kilometers, and you'll be able to truck things all the way across right in the bank. Uh, it's a major, major development, but it's also prompting a major Thai push to figure out how to close the remaining nine refugee camps uh, harboring refugees from Burma. Uh, Karen, Mon, and Kareni refugees, uh, 140,000 of them. Uh, the Thai National Security Council has already stated very publicly that they want to close those camps. Uh, they're pressuring uh, UNHCR and others to become involved with uh, some sort of repatriation plan. At the same time when ethnic violence uh, attacks by the government against ethnic minorities are increasing in Burma. So, you know, on one hand the, the international community and groups working with refugees and of course human rights organizations like ours are saying, what are you talking about? There's been no change in Burma. There's been no significant improvement uh, in human rights in Burma. You want to send the refugees back into that? And the answer is yes. The unwritten reason is because that's part of the deal to do these kind of economic development projects and also to uh, increasingly stabilize Thai Burma relations. Yeah. With Vietnam, uh, we saw uh, in September last year, it was quite, it was quite, it was quite astonishing. Um, the colleagues from the International Federation for Human Rights based in Europe, a major international human rights group. We're prepared to release a report on Vietnam at the Foreign Correspondents of Public Thailand. Uh, and the Vietnamese government contacted the Thai government and said, we'd like that not to proceed, please. And instead of dismissing that out of hand or saying, look, you know, we have freedom of expression here, uh, the Thai Ministry of Foreign Affairs took that on board brought up the issue with the four correspondents of public Thailand. I know because the, the president's a friend of mine. Uh, the journalists, of course, said we're not going to censor anybody. Uh, we'll talk to somebody else. And so the Thais uh, recognized where the people were coming to from Europe to, to make this presentation, uh, contacted the airlines, uh, Singapore Air, which was all, all more than happy to uh, not allow them onto the plane. So, you know, these sort of things uh, were almost unimaginable in Thailand four to five years ago, but in this case, um, we see the Thailand government responding to its more repressive neighbors, in part, we believe, because of their sensitivities related to their own internal problems. Um, let me just talk a little bit about uh, some of these countries here, and uh, then we can get into some questions. Um, Vietnam, as I said, is become a very, very aggressive um, rights abusing uh, authoritarian one party state. Uh, it's always been one party state. Um, but it has a growing economy, it's got a rapidly expanding agriculture and industrial sectors, increasing exports. And with that has actually come uh, the fastest growing internet usage in the region, accompanied by an increasingly vocal citizenry and lots of reasons to complain. A lot of corruption, uh, especially related to land grabbing by well-connected elites. Uh, you know, as you have land in cities that all that wasn't previously not so valuable, but all of a sudden the cost rises very quickly. Those who have power are using that power to uh, seize and make ill-gotten ill gains. You have unresponsive and self-interested bureaucrats who are involved in that, 
and who also, again, when citizens come to complain, ignore them. Uh, rapidly rising inflation, cost base goods going up, all these things. And what we've seen is that the, the Vietnamese Communist Party, which of course is the, uh, the leading party uh, by the Constitution, Article 4 of the Constitution, has set out a, a, a specific role for uh, leading the country, is working very hard to keep the lid on popular unrest. Um, they remain keenly concerned about some sort of jasmine revolution, you know, sort of the, the Asian response to the Arab Spring. Um, and I think they're keenly concerned that they might be vulnerable because not only these internal pressures that I mentioned, but also the, president, the presence of a dedicated exile movement, a movement which has been aimed at toppling the government for a number of years and, and restoring democracy, but has not really ever been able to get much uh, sort of a, of a foothold in, in that. Uh, so the Vietnamese government is working very hard to keep groups off the streets and basically keep their international opponents off balance. Um, we see an expanding crackdown on activist dissidents, including political activists, petitioners for land, rights, independent labor activists, uh, bloggers, independent religionists such as the United Unified Buddhist Church, American uh, temples in the Delta, independent house churches in the Central Highlands, etc. Uh, these groups uh, are hit with a, a variety of charges. Uh, anti anti state propaganda, trying to overthrow the state. Sometimes a mixture of uh, economic crimes where they're alleged to have somehow uh, violated the tax code. In some ways, it, it's remarkably similar to the kind of charges that are brought against dissidents in China. Um, the Ministry of Public Security, which, which oversees the internal response by the police, is ascendant, it's expanding its reach. Police are becoming much more influential. As we can see, actually, in the case of, a, and I'll pass this around, this is a report that we did, uh, party versus legal activist Ku Hui Ha Vu. Ku Hui Ha Vu, uh, from a revolutionary family of long standing, his father was a patriot of Ho Chi Minh, uh, close with the military, uh, was still uh, uh, jailed for seven years uh, for his activism. And uh, people thought previously that he was untouchable. Uh, but this reflects the fact that the Ministry of Public Security is, in fact, becoming think much more, much more powerful. Pass that around for people to take a look at. Um, there's been no quarter on freedom of association, expected, especially in key sectors like labor. The Vietnam General Confederation of Labor uh, continues to be the sole recognized labor federation. And originally, they were much more lenient with labor protests. They've now been cracking down uh, more, hard, uh, more hard on wildcat strikes, trying to identify leaders who are uh, prompting labor unrest. And um, we did a recent report on uh, abuses uh, against independent churches in the Central Highlands, uh, also about Hmong groups in the north. These independent churches are viewed as suspicion, basically seen as some sort of fronts for uh, anti-state activities. The interesting thing, however, um, as you look at Vietnam, and this is something that is affecting the human rights climate throughout the Mekong subregion, is there's a, you know, like in Afghanistan, they called it the great game between Britain and, and Russia in the, in the 1800s of who was going to control Afghanistan. To a certain extent, there's a new great game going on within Southeast Asia. But uh, the, the, the two players in the United States, the uh, People's Republic of China. What we're finding is uh, renewed military relations from the U.S. Uh, with, for instance, Vietnam, with Cambodia. Of course, they had a close relationship with Thailand already, but also with Laos. Only Burma remains beyond the pale. And in looking at Vietnam recently, China has been claiming the South China Sea. Uh, they've said that the South China Sea is entirely theirs and have recently classified it as what they call a core interest, which is language they used previously to discuss uh, Tibet and Taiwan. <clears throat> so this has caused a great deal of angst within ASEAN, because of course Vietnam has claims, but also Malaysia and Philippines have claims in the South China Sea as well. And it's interesting now, and, and, and this goes to the issue of, you know, who are the emerging leaders within ASEAN, 
that Vietnam is taking the lead to challenge China's claims in the South China Sea. And this is noticed in us. You know. um, Vietnam was the one who put the discussion of the Code of Conduct on South China Sea uh, on the agenda at the ASEAN Regional Forum over Chinese objections. And uh, you know, when Hillary Clinton attended that uh, the R and, and said that the United States, quote, the United States has a national interest in freedom of navigation, open access to Asia Maritime Commons, and respect for international law in the South China Sea, which doesn't sound too controversial, China went ballistic. They went crazy. Because essentially, they're accusing Vietnam of bringing the Americans in. And Vietnam is playing the other way, too. Vietnam will increasingly use that leverage with the Americans to get catch a break on the issues related to human rights. On to Cambodia. Um, the saying Cambodia is in the land of the blind, the one man, the one-eyed man is king. The one-eyed man who is king in Cambodia is Hun Sen. And Sitting with Christopher Peshu, from the Office of High Commissioner of Human Rights, who was essentially run out of the country, <clears throat> we sat and did a sort of what we we'll call a sort of five-finger assessment. Um, when you look at the, the sort of sources of control in any given country, their politics, judiciary, security forces, engagement of the international community or development partners, and in civil society. In Cambodia, what we see is an absolute majority after the 2000 elections for Hun Sen. He's essentially vanquished his, his, uh, his opponents within the, the, the CPP, the Cambodian People's Party. So the, the faction, uh, the Sarkang Chiasim faction that used to be contesting Hun Sen has basically been pushed aside. Uh, the opposition is in disarray. Uh, Sam Ramsey, the uh, opposition leader, is in exile facing 12 years in prison if he returns to Cambodia. Uh, there's, there's fighting between the, the different parts of the opposition. The opposition doesn't have enough votes to stop anything from going to the National Assembly. Uh, independent media in Khmer language. They don't care about the English language media, but the, 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 the Khmer language media has largely been uh, destroyed. Uh, they have a complete total lock on the judiciary. They have a complete total lock on the army and police. And now what we see is <clears throat> Hun Sen going after the international community. Why is he doing that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, the international community are the first line of defense for Cambodian human rights defenders. And, and this is really quite critical. Um, they're the ones, for instance, the Office of High Commissioner of Human Rights would be able to protect land rights campaigners, others who are facing intimidation by the police and military. And we've seen over the past year and a half um, uh, the blacklisting of Christophe Peshu, who is the head of the Office of High Commission of Human Rights, including uh, basically a letter sent around, a note verbal sent around by the foreign minister saying to, to all ministries that they should have nothing to do with him. Um, uh, the threat to throw the head of the UNDP out of the country for comments related to the anti-corruption law, which basically said the anti-corruption law was, was brought out with three days' notice before it was going to the National Assembly, and he said it would be nice to have some more time for consultation with civil society. And he was almost thrown out for that. <clears throat> the imprisonment of uh, someone from WFP, a senior premier staff, uh, what he did was he printed out something from an internet site that wasn't banned, uh, that was caught under the new penal code saying disinformation. He was sentenced in a 12 minute trial to six months. Um, and demands to close the um, office, high commissioner's office in Cambodia, including a stormy meeting uh, with the UN Secretary General, uh, which Hun Sen basically told the UN Secretary to, to go off. So, um, Really off the wall, but complete diminishing of political space and protection for human rights defenders. Um, when we hear about issues of the Jasmine Revolution, uh, you know, there was some people overseas Khmer's who were, were raising this. 
Poon Sen likes to stand up and give speeches with, uh, with sort of local Khmer sayings. He said that anybody who wanted to raise the Jasmine Revolution uh, would be treated, well, well he said, I will, I will take that person like in a dog and I'll close the door and beat the dog, which is a, a Khmer saying basically, kill the dog. So if you challenge me, watch out. Coming around to civil society, what we see is, uh, again, a, a rapidly narrowing space. One which is very, very worrisome because one of the legacies of the UN, and particularly the United Nations Transactional, Transitional uh, Authority in Cambodia, was the blossoming of a significant civil society in Cambodia that has been engaged for years in providing development, protecting human rights, uh, doing many other things. Um, a draft NGO law, which we expect uh, the authorities will push through the, 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 by the end of this year, basically says, if you are not a registered NGO, you cannot operate in this country. Full stop. Freedom of association violation in its most extreme form. And a decision that you are not a registered NGO, that you cannot register, is fine. There's no, there's no form of appeal. From there, everything else falls. And I won't bore you with all the details. But suffice to say, it's a classic Cambodian draft law with <clears throat> poorly defined terms, plenty of discretion for civil servants and politicians to make decisions on how to interpret it and um, poorly fashioned reasons for why they need it. Um, connected also to this is uh, sort of the other law, which is the sort of second blow against uh, civil society in Cambodia, which is a draft trade union law. So similarly, as they're going after the NGOs, they're also going after the trade unions. And uh, again, the issue of registration is, is front and center. There's wide discretion for denying registration. There's limited appeal mechanisms. Worrisingly, there's a third party provision saying that a third party can file a complaint to be registered in the own. So, Cambodia is sliding backwards rapidly uh, from, a, from a position of about 15 years ago where we thought actually this was one of the countries where human rights and, and sort of more inclusive participatory democracy was really going to take hold, it's really slid back tremendously. Um, Burma, of course, what to say about Burma? 2,100 political prisoners, no one's been released. Aung San Suu Kyi was released, but her, her, prison certain, her prison sentence was up, and frankly it was a charge that she shouldn't have been imprisoned for in the first place, or held under house arrest as the case may be. Um, significant and fundamental uh, electoral violations in that, in that election. People have said that that election was anywhere free or fair, it wasn't. Uh, you had uh, ballot stuffing, you had manipulation of lists, you had just about every sort of electoral uh, violation you can imagine to ensure that the party connected with the generals was going to win successor to the USDA, the USDP. Um, what we see is also renewed fighting uh, in ethnic areas initiated by the army, initiated by uh, the Burmese army, the Tatmadaw. Uh, in short, Shan State, Karen State, Kachin State. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to force these ethnic nationalities to accept, the ceasefire groups to accept to be what are called border guard forces under the control of the Burmese army. And with that, basically to turn over their weapons. And this is, this, is where, this is where it really comes down to it for the ethnic minorities. They have been willing to sign ceasefires, they've been willing to talk politics, but they have been able to get nowhere in terms of any sort of uh, recognition of, of ethnic claims, autonomy, any, any of those uh, demands that they made, they, they've been off the table. The, the military won't discuss them. It's, it's basically, you surrender, you become a border guard force, and we'll leave you alone. Our way or the highway. And um, we expect to see more and more fighting of this sort, too, as the military now tries to uh, 
once again uh, assert control in the ethnic areas. Um, the Aung San Suu Kyi opening, I would say now it's perhaps closing. Uh, you recall the thing that triggered the actions against her in 2003, uh, resulting in the Dead Yin massacre where she was almost killed, uh, and where uh, you know, several dozen of NDL, NLD people were killed. These were prompted by the fact that she was going up country and she was holding rallies and giving speeches. And people turn out by the hundreds of thousands. I mean, she had a million people in Chin State show up to hear her speak. Um, so, you know, this is sort of a person where, you know, if she walked down the street in Tokyo, you could imagine that everybody with an eyesight with her would immediately rush to see her. Imagine that in Burma and then some. This is the drawing power of this woman, and it's profoundly frightening to the Burmese generals. And so this is why we're now hearing them coming out and saying, um, you can't practice politics, the NLD is uh, a deregistered party, uh, if you continue to do this, we can't say what's going to happen to you. It's part because she's going back up country, out to the masses, to talk to people and you know, once again give them hope that there's, there's some sort of alternative to Burmese military rule. Uh, for us at Human Rights Watch, we're pressing very hard uh, for a Burmese a commission of inquiry, an independent and partial commission of inquiry uh, that would be uh, uh, authorized in some way by the UN. And there's a couple different ways it could happen. Uh, it's been endorsed by, I think at last count, 17 different governments. A lot of Europeans, US, Australia, Canada. Japan has not endorsed it. Japan has continued to uh, publicly oppose it, well, not privately oppose it, and publicly say nothing. Um, the terms of that reference would basically be look at uh, uh, crimes against humanity uh, committed by both sides, because there are, in fact, some violations also by ethnic, ethnic armies who have been rebels for a number of years, for instance, primarily on the child soldiers. Uh, but again, from about Burma, I, I, I've been working on it for years. Uh, it, you never get seem to get good news. And um, now we're looking at Burma possibly chairing ASEAN in 2014. Uh, I think that that may actually happen in November at the next ASEAN meeting. And, and that's to us profoundly disturbing. And I think we'll uh, put an exclamation points on the, the sort of anti-human rights uh, orientation of a uh, number of countries in ASEAN. Uh, Thailand. Landslide. Uh, in Lak uh, 265 seats. Uh, what this, the challenge here now will be for the Thai government to put reconciliation and accountability back on the table. Um, if the Democrats had won, or uh, a coalition government had been formed with the Democrats, everything that happened last year would have been whitewashed. Uh, the, the excessive use of force by the military, also the, the use uh, of the black shirts, the, the, the militants within the red shirt ranks, their, their actions, all that would have been whitewashed, and all that would have been pushed aside in history. This leaves these issues open. The question is, how are they handled? And our concern is that we will go back to a historical pattern, which has happened in 1973, after the, the violence then, 1976, the, the massacre of the students at Tamasat, 1992, the people who were shot dead during the Black May events and, and, and wrapped on them, that uh, there will be a cursory investigation followed by an amnesty for all and some sort of forgotten compensation package for people uh, who had their relatives killed or injured. And no real break, no real accountability in terms of holding people uh, accountable for actions. And so we're trying to engage right now with the, with the Kuwait uh, party to say, look, you know, there, there needs to be uh, a more empowered truth and reconciliation Committee, one that, that exists now but doesn't have subpoena power, has not been able to get information from the military, 
has not been able to get cooperation from the Red Shirts and to get them to be in a position to actually come out with a comprehensive set of recommendations that then can be acted upon uh, by prosecutors and courts. You know, so if you know army snipers were shooting unarmed persons uh, 400 meters away in the head, which they were, you know, and they should be held accountable. If black shirts were uh, were were attacking uh, and, and killing civilians, they should be held accountable. You know, these are these are the things that we're we're pushing for. It's hard to see how it's going to come out, but I expect that we will have a stable government of 300 or more MPs, uh, uh, probably even maybe as early tomorrow, uh, and all these issues will will be on the table uh, for discussion. Um, Thailand has other deep-rooted human rights problems. Long history of disappearances and extrajudicial killings, uh, violence in the southern three provinces, Patani and Iwan Yala, where there's never been any uh, government official held accountable, a war on drugs that still remains uninvestigated, with over 2,800 people killed in a period of six months when Thaksin Shinawa was in power. And this will, of course, be also something that will be pressed on the government. Uh, uh, being luck, what will be done about that? Refugees, migrant workers, uh, you know, non Thais who effectively are, are, are victimized. So, Thailand, a, a work in process, but I think sliding backwards. Laos, always Laos at the end. <laughs> I don't know what to say about Laos except to say that. Um, there's a competition going on. It's quite interesting between Vietnam and China for for Vietnam's favor. It's a, it's a back and saw, back and forth sort of uh, seesaw battle. Um, Laos always gets away with everything because they seem to be a nice place to visit. People don't go there uh, as much as they uh, people go there for vacations. And everybody's so nice. But uh, if you challenge the government, if you hold a form a legal organization, if you Try to hold a protest, do any of those things, you'll be treated as badly as in Burma or worse. And uh, Laos, we will do a report on Laos all these things. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's a really thorough tour d'horizon, a very complex region. I think what, what Southeast Asia has, which very few other regions of the world have, is enormous diversity within it. I mean, cultural, linguistic, I mean, you could. Talk about Western Europe, the countries do share a lot in terms of their political system, their economy, their, economy, their history. I mean, same to a lesser extent with the Arab world, with parts of Africa. I and mean, really, Southeast Asia, every country is so different. Uh, but I'm sure we, in 16 years, you must have worked very hard to understand all of them. Um, so uh, I'll take the advantage of chairing this as first question. Uh, if I were a US policymaker, or Japanese policymaker, and I said to you, okay, we have a problem with China. Uh, we think Chinese actions in the past several years have demonstrated uh, attitudes and goals which are uh, detrimental to Japanese, US, and allied interests. Uh, Vietnam is a logical ally. Uh, why should we support the Vietnamese government? It looks fairly stable. Uh, it sounds like Bashir al-Assad or Gaddafi that's about to be overthrown. Uh, why should we push them on human rights when we really have strategic and military goals in common? After all, no, we, we fought World War II with the Soviets. Uh, Stalin was a mass genocider, uh, but it helped us win. It's, a, it's, a, it's an argument actually here on a fairly regular basis. Um, our response uh, comes back to the, the core issue that at, at the end of the day, uh, there will be change in Vietnam. And that By supporting human rights, by supporting these issues, actually, uh, you know, you not only uh, strengthen the hand of the people who are actually working for reform in Turkey, and that that's not just like you know, sort of the isolated dissidents, you know, the block eight, four or six people, but I mean, in a lot of cases, it's um, uh, retired military officers who you know have relatives who've lost their land to a land crash or something like that. I mean, this is where the nexus between human rights 
and, and corruption, human rights abuses and corruption really comes into play. And, and what we're seeing in Vietnam, and this is the fascinating thing that, that, that is accelerating as we're seeing it, 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 as we're watching it, is that uh, essentially different groups who previously would have no ability to talk, communicate with each other, uh, are doing so and are actually sort of rallying behind uh, each other in, in sort of common causes. This was the, actually the lesson of the, of the report that I was sending around about uh, Wu. Uh, essentially, you had a mass mobilization uh, on his behalf, something that was unprecedented. Um, and to the extent that they actually had to sort of, uh, almost sort of barricade uh, the Hanoi courthouse because so many people showed up outside wanting to uh, show support for him. You know, people, uh, common citizens, taking flowers past his uh, office. You know, they had, had, they had the Ministry of Public Security had to keep sending pickup trucks to drag away the flowers in front of his, in front of his office. So I think that over the longer term, uh, you know, Vietnam's interests in terms of concern with China, uh, concern with um, uh, its, its sort of expansionist tendencies in the South China Sea, but also in terms of um, what China's doing in the region, I don't think that's going to change uh, whether you're talking about a one-party government or a multi-party government. What I think will change is that there will be a movement away from this sort of one one party rule, and I think it will it will, it will come gradually. I don't think we're expecting any sort of uh, big Arab Spring push, but uh, what we'd be saying to people who are saying, well, "Geez, you have to work with the Vietnamese," I say, "Well, look, you you can work on the Vietnamese in many different levels, but you can't leave a basic element like human rights out of the picture because if you do that, essentially." Uh, you're not being true to what your, uh, what your people want. That's certainly the citizens of the US, Australia, and others who would basically support human rights issues in, in Vietnam and things like that. But also, um, you know, you'll be remembered as basically being an accomplice uh, to these countries, similar to like the US is seen as an accomplice to uh, Hosni Mubarak and to uh, some of the other uh, Arab autocrats who are now facing uh, the people. Now let me ask you question number two. Uh, and then afterwards, we will open and discuss them to the floor. And this is a democracy, well, not a real democracy, there's uh, some elements of freedom left in this institution. Uh, there are several ways an autocrat can go. Uh, he can, like the late King Faisal of uh, Iraq, uh, be slaughtered by an angry mob. Uh, he can go into very prosperous exile with all of his own God and loot. He can leave with some of his money. Uh, he can end up, as Milosevic did in The Hague, uh, tried for uh, war crimes, and I don't know if he was also indicted for crimes against humanity. He truly yes. deserved it. Yes. Uh, and you know, the arguments, one argument is that criminals they should end up in The Hague, or you know, you know, I think it's a sure off for the, for yeah, the well, African once. I don't think there's one in East Asia yet. No. Uh, the counter argument is you don't want these guys to fight to the death, so you want to offer them, as was done in a lot of Latin American countries, a deal. Say, mm -hmm. look, you know, you leave, uh, you can keep, you know, under a billion dollars, it's yours. Uh, we will not uh, try you. Uh, and in exchange, you will not get involved in politics. You know, you, you'll go back into retirement and won't disturb the democratic and liberal transition, uh, which did happen in some societies. Uh, what's the right way of dealing with this? Think of places like Burma especially, yeah. uh, Cambodia, in fact, uh, one day China maybe. I don't, you know, I mean, I hate to say it, but I, you know, I've, been, I've been watching Burma for years and, and basically been working on it. Um, and I've never seen any indication that uh, that the Burmese generals are prepared to do anything except basically digging their heels and fight right to the right to the death anyways. Um, I mean, it, it, it's connected to a little bit of the sort of megalomaniacal uh, political culture that they've adopted, the sort of belief in the Tatmada as the as the sole provider for unity of the, of the union of Myanmar. I mean, it, it connected to their whole sort of world construct. You know, and having walked around uh, their military museum, you know. You actually see that 
you know, they actually, they've actually been drinking the Kool-Aid. They believe this. Um, so I think in, in terms of Burma, um, you know, I think we need to press because part of what we also do, and, and, and the things that they've actually responded to, is they respond to the fear of being, you know, sort of brought up in the, brought up in the Hague or, you know, brought up before International Criminal Court. Although we believe very clearly that the, the, there's very little likelihood that the commission of inquiry that we're calling for in Burma is going to actually end up with Tan Shui, you know, before the ICC, um, in part because they haven't, they haven't signed uh, the Rome Statute, in part because uh, I don't see any way to actually dislodge him. But what you do in these cases is you have to uh, increase pressure by actually demonstrating in a very articulate and clear way in a, with an impartial investigation the issues of human rights abuse that are, that are before us. Um, in the case of Burma, actually this was done on forced labor. By the ILO, there was a secondary commission of inquiry looking into the failure of the government to uh, implement its obligations as a ratifying state of violence convention 29, forced labor. And that was actually what prompted the whole opening for the ILO to go into Burma and uh, basically push the government to outlaw forced labor and then start taking actions against that. Since then, they've really slid back again. Uh, we're going to be coming out with a report on the 13th of uh, July uh, looking at uh, uh, the use of prison porters, porters from, the, from the prison systems who are used by uh, basic cannon fodder and, and uh, carry-alls by the military on the front lines. It's called dead men walking. And that's exactly what it is. Those people basically use to, we call atrocity mining, where they're sending uh, these men in front of the troops through minefields to clear away. And, uh, you know, of course, it also, if you can't carry the load anymore, uh, shooting and killing people on the side of the trail. So um, I think in Burma's case, it'd be very, very difficult to see how you would actually dislodge them. Our, our argument, I guess, I would say in general is that. By demanding accountability uh, in, in specific cases uh, for, for, for leaders who have you know, systematically abused human rights, who have committed crimes against humanity, um, it's something that actually uh, affects behavior of other, other leaders. And, um, you know, when you get into these sort of transitions where, if you're, for instance, they're they're losing control of the people, and there's a sort of a Hosni Mubarak sort of moment. Um, you know, we'll be there calling for accountability. Other people will be calling for, you know, let them go to the seaside resort with this money. And, uh, you know, somewhere it's going to come out in the middle there. Um, but we're not going to step back from calling for accountability because actually we believe that by demanding accountability, uh, you actually empower people to effectively oppose those persons who have committed, you know, weakened them internally, if they're actually called up as certain things, or if they're actually, uh, you know, labeled as someone, like, for instance, uh, Bashir in Sudan is, you know, who has to travel with a great deal of care, uh, make sure that he doesn't end up uh, being arrested and sent to the, sent to the international criminal court. So, now the past we, this one around as well. Now we, we move to the democratic transition, that is, you get to speak. Uh, so, who would like to ask a question? Can you introduce yourself as well? Yeah. Yes. Um, it's just a little business now. Um, one question regarding, uh, from business side, can, can we take a kind of a carrot and stick approach to, to make this country to be democratic, saying that the, um, let me introduce one my example when I visited Cambodia. Um, Chinese companies are aggressive to do business with them. They they are uh, trying to make a great connection to the to the government officials, like uh, uh, making other advertisement to celebrate the Hun Prime Minister Hun Sen's birthday on yeah. newspaper. While Western com companies are cautious about getting uh, getting along with them because yeah. of, from the perspective of compliance. Based on that, I understand. Uh, uh, talking about the same thing opposite, you could say that uh, if they became um, more democratic, Western countries will um, 
give them the opportunity to do business with them. And also we can approach China to step into our side, the democratic side. That kind of multiple approach could be useful. Is it dreamy to do this way? Well, I mean, I think it would be. I think. I think what we were talking about is trying to um, influence governments to basically do good so they can do well themselves. Um, uh, I mean, broadly, broadly, the broad idea I would say of like trying to get some sort of standards by way of company to business is important. And I think that the problem is, for instance, you know, some of these Chinese Chinese companies in Cambodia know exactly what they're doing. And, it, and what they're doing is they're taking advantage of a highly corrupt system where key officials uh, in the CPP, um, you know, are prepared for money to grant them access, for instance, to uh, natural nature reserves, you know, where you have uh, land being seized, or to uh, support, you know, uh, a military unit to help a company clear certain areas of people. I mean, one of the biggest problems in Cambodia is, is uh, land grabbing. And, and it's probably the issue that affects the human rights situation in Cambodia the most, because of course, you're not only dispossessing people of land, but you're dispossessing of their livelihoods. There's uh, violations in terms of beatings, abuse, in some cases, killings. Um, and this is, there's just, a, it's just a, it's an epidemic right now in terms of so, I mean, what you have is actually Chinese companies encouraging things to go the wrong way. Um, uh, so, I think actually what, what what we require would be that there should be some of these uh, Western governments or development partners with the companies, basically saying, "Look, you know, if you promote that kind of system, it's unfair to us. Uh, you'll have difficulties doing business with us." Uh, you may have problems with our customers in terms of not wanting to have a garment or something made in Cambodia if we're not reasonably assured that it was done in a way that um, you know, didn't result in human rights abuses. I mean, this is a big issue right now uh, in Cambodia uh, with the European Union's trade preference program called Anything But Arms. And Anything But Arms uh, provides uh, uh, duty-free entry of, of goods produced in Cambodia into the European Union. And that program has prompted uh, a number of, for instance, senators like Li Fat, who's from Hong Kong product right next to Thailand, with good connections with all the Thai sugar companies, to go in and basically be seizing land with the support of Hun Sen and the military. You know, he's seizing 10,000 hectares, 20,000 hectares, and turning them into sugarcane plantations, chasing all the, the villagers out. And those, that sugar is being uh, produced and packaged and sold to the European Union by, you know, these Thai Cambodian joint ventures. So, you know, you know how, how people do business actually impacts the, um, you know, sort of the governance and human rights situations in these countries in a very major way. Um, my question is, what did your, the Human Rights Watch is um, target or strategy to move forward the democratization or the betterment of the human rights in those areas you mentioned? Well, I mean, Human Rights Watch, we, we have a couple different strategies that, that are sort of core strategies of ours. One strategy, of course, is to embarrass them for which we are highly unpopular. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I mean, we basically go in and, and, and do, a, do an analysis and, and, you know, the governments may not like what we want to say, but you know, we would hope that they would recognize that we're thorough and we're accurate in what we're, we're producing. A lot of what we do is we talk to the media uh, because you'll find that in many of these countries, unless it appears in the media, unless there's, there's something that is going on in public, these things remain private, and, the, and, and these uses remain unaddressed. So there's always a there's always a sort of publicity angle to it. Uh, and then, in many cases, because you know, if I go and meet with a Cambodian government official and say I'm from Human Rights Watch, uh, you know, we really don't think you're doing the right thing here. Uh, 
um, they might listen to me, but oftentimes, you know, they won't give me the meeting because, you know, they're like, why do I want to go talk to this fussy guy from Human Rights Watch who's just going to give me a hard time? You know, I don't want to hear it. Uh, <clears throat> so what we have to do is we have to find people who have influence with these governments to try to change behavior. And frequently, particularly in um, places like Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, those are international donors. Those are the, what we call development partners. So, uh, might be the U.S. Embassy, might be the Australian Embassy, might be one of the European countries, could be the Canadians, uh, depending on what they're doing. You know, and and because they're providing assistance in various different sectors and things like that, if they raise an issue, uh, the government will at least uh, listen or give the formality of listening. Uh, we try also to sometimes mobilize the UN, uh, UN country team. More difficult because um, they're even more medicine to uh, raise a sort of untoward word towards the host government than, than the bilateral donors. Uh, we do a lot of work um, uh, with the UN Human Rights Council and with various different mechanisms in the, in the UN uh, to try to raise issues. We do a lot of work on various different um, treaty bodies, uh, you know, for instance, all these countries in, that we're talking about have all ratified uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And uh, they've all also, also ratified the uh, Convention Against Discrimination Against Women. So these, anytime we have something coming up on those issues, we will try to uh, push uh, those angles as well. It's hard. I mean, I'll be honest. We, sometimes we really lack uh, tools or leverage to do the kind of things we want to do. Um, that said, I mean, uh, we, we get a lot of small pictures. I mean, you know, protecting a particular person who's fighting for his community. You know, uh, getting uh, a public statement that you know makes a minister pause. Something like that. Um, not always immediately visible. But over the long term, you know, we, we do see that. You, you've mentioned several countries, US, Australia. Uh, what you mentioned is Japan. Japan is a fairly large donor. I mean, the Japanese ODA has uh, gone down considerably. Uh, so could you tell us uh, about your relationship with the Japanese government, how it helps you uh, promote a human rights agenda? It's a very good question. Uh, when you don't have a great answer, you always say something's a work in progress. Yeah. In, Jap in Japan, to say it's a very good question is very Japanese, I think. Yeah. Well, what I would say is this. Um, we have an office here in Tokyo. Um, and what we're trying to do, we're trying to do a couple different things here. Uh, first of all, we're trying to raise issues related to specific countries uh, to the Japanese foreign ministry and the Japanese leaders in the diet and, and others uh, to try to raise the awareness and raise concerns about human rights abuses uh, and try to get them to also then pressure the bureaucrats at MOFA and other places like that to, to take these into consideration. Um, the other thing we're doing is working with and trying to foster with partners a, a, you know, a greater awareness of human rights and, and, and building a sort of civil society movement for human rights in Japan. You know, supporting when we can organizations and other groups, uh, you know, working with them, uh, helping with their causes, uh, you know, uh, providing support in terms of like, you know, publicity or knowledge and know-how that we might have and how to, how to proceed with things. You know, trying to do everything we can to, to get the word out. Because what we want to do, what we recognize is that, you know, Japan as a democratic country, at the end of the day, you know, we hope that uh, there will be enough public voices coming out that then this becomes a, a, an issue of concern to uh, Japanese politicians and the Japanese bureaucrats that they have to respond. We'll also be doing research. I think we're going to be doing research, I think, looking at Japanese foreign assistance. Um, you know, probably focusing on a couple countries where uh, Japanese foreign assistance has either uh, not protected human rights or has contributed to situations where made a human rights situation worse. Uh, and we will do that um, 
and come out with a report like that one. Um, examining, I think, uh, some broad issues related to Japanese foreign assistance, but then also looking at some specific cases of certain countries. But if you were to compare, say, how you welcome in Japanese embassies compared to, say, the U.S. or Australian embassies in the region, how how is your interaction with diplomats in Southeast Asia? Uh, well, we always, we, we always, we, I mean, we will always get a, a polite reception mm -hmm. from the Japanese embassy. Uh, they will listen to what we have to say. Uh, we will usually get the meeting, which is more than we can say about a lot of uh, Asian countries, you know. Um, <clears throat> but at the end of the day, uh, you know, I, I, you get the sense that we've given them some talking points to uh, go into a cable that will be sent back to Tokyo saying that they met with Human Rights Watch. Um, you don't get the sense that uh, it really has affected the argument directly. Now, sometimes, sometimes we, and, and this is part of the information that we need to have, we have to have more information about what is being done with Japanese foreign assistance so we're better prepared to make the arguments. I'll give you an example from Cambodia. I met with the Japanese ambassador to Cambodia, very nice man. Uh, and Japan has just finished supporting the creation of a civil code for, for Cambodia. It's a long-term legal project. And within that civil code, there's provisions for registration of non-governmental organizations. Uh, you know, ways that could be, way they could be registered, regulated, and all these things like that. And so what we were saying to the ambassador was like, well, now there's also this NGO law that looks much, much worse. Uh, will in fact probably be used as a political weapon against uh, Cambodian NGOs, uh, international NGOs that uh, the government doesn't like. And it's going to directly contradict with your beautiful civil code that you spent all your money and all your time doing over the past five or seven years. And, you know, that argument gains some ground. But it had to be argued on the basis of, like, Japan has done this thing which Cambodians should be thankful for, and here's how they're thanking you. They're going to pass another law that's going to actually contradict parts of the law that you put together with technical assistance in Japan. And how many, if you were to look at your staff in the region, uh, how many Japanese are there compared, say, to Australians, Americans, Europeans, Southeast Asians themselves? Let's see here. Based on the region. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. Well, I mean, Japan is our biggest office in the region. Uh, part, we have two people there. And we have a lot of interns. Uh, the I would say that they're fairly well represented. I mean, I think we have two Australians, uh, two Americans, Thai, Indonesian, uh, maybe 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 three Americans. But, you know, I mean, broadly broadly, you know, up there with the with, with the rest. Uh, no, no but they're all based. But they're all based in Japan. Okay. Yeah. No Russian, no American, no Latin American. Uh, Sorry, no Russians, no Africans, no Latin Americans. In our Asia staff. Yeah. Uh, no Russians, no Latin Americans. <laughs> Africans. Not in our, not in our staff in Asia. In our staff in Africa, sure. Uh, I mean, we, we're we're an organization that works in ninety countries around the around the world. So. You know, the Asian division is just one division uh, of a larger organization. But, um, no, I mean, uh, with the exception of the Americans, everybody's from the region, and I count Australia as being part of the region. <coughs> questions? Yes. This is not necessarily about Southeast Asia, but um, just about the Japan office. I know it's, it's, it's what, the fourth year now, or? Yeah, and I know it's been quite successful at fundraising and being able to create the funds to um, do further investigations in regards to North Korea or um, mm -hmm. I think they also did, um, but, um, but do you, well I know they funded, they, 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 they were able to raise funds for, um, also for a Chechenia report and so on I think. 
But um, will, will, the, will the office in Japan ever look at human rights issues in Japan such as, I mean it's not like there's loads of them being violated here, but issues such as trafficking and so on, or is it mainly used as an office um, to, to do what you just described or to raise money to also um, support and fund investigations in other regions like North Korea, right. other regional. The, the office Office. here was originally set up as, uh, as a joint advocacy and development office. Mm, okay. So to start with, it was, it was talking about, of course, uh, raising money to make sure that it was sustainable itself. And also doing advocacy, uh, you know, recognizing that Japanese foreign assistance is such a major, uh, they're such a large donor that there, there, there's influence there if we, can, if we can move them on human rights issues. Uh, however, increasingly we will be doing work on, 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 on Japanese human rights issues, I think. Um, we have been involved in a lot of LGBT work here. Uh, we're also looking uh, at the way that Japan um, receives and, and, and uh, receives refugees. Uh, we're particularly concerned about the fact that Japan seems to um, have very, very few what we call UNHCR mandate refugees. They sort of put them in a sort of separate category, you know, not wanting to recognize them under the convention, and we want to sort of get to the bottom of, you know, how are these uh, refugee status determinations being done here, you know, by the Japanese authorities? You know, are they fair? Are they impartial? Are they in line with uh, Japan's obligations under the 1951 convention, the 67 protocol? So, uh, you know, I think what we're doing is we're sort of edging into it, but. <clears throat> When we first started, you know, what we have to prove is that one, uh, an office can get up and stand up here. Two, that it can uh, build support within Japanese society for not only working on Japanese issues, but also working on issues writ large in Asia around the world. Uh, and then three, uh, you know, basically gain enough knowledge or information about what we can productively do to contribute to the, the human rights dialogue and try to solving problems in, in, in Japan itself as well. I mean, I think, you know, it's, if, if, we're, if we're given the choice of working on uh, a human rights project in Japan versus a human rights project in North Korea, you know, it's hard to argue that we should do the work on Japan first because the situation is so bad in North Korea. But I, I think that uh, we will, as we continue to expand our presence here, we'll be able to Control, since you mentioned North Korea, um, are these South Koreans active in human rights watch? I'm asking you especially whether South Korea, unlike Japan, went through a very recent democratic transition yeah. and a domestic, one that came out as a result of domestic developments rather than here as a result of foreign occupation. So, what role does South Korea play in human rights, South Korea and South Koreans? Um, well, in terms of in terms of South Korea, uh, we actually, Human Rights Watch was, was very active on South Korea in the, in the 80s and early 90s. Uh, actually starting as, as, as our predecessor, we used to have what they were called the Watch Committee. So there was Asia Watch, Africa Watch, America's Watch, and then they all sort of came together and, and merged and became Human Rights Watch. Uh, <clears throat> so during that whole period of transition, uh, dealing with the human rights abuses in South Korea by the, the military government of the dictators there before the democratic transition we were dealing with that. And we were also very involved uh, in the early to mid-90s uh, on labor rights issues in South Korea. Um, we have increasingly become much more involved in North Korean issues and our researcher uh, who recently left us, um, uh, who was working on North Korea, was from South Korea. Um, what we're looking at now, and, and, and there's, there's plans afoot to uh, hold a conference here in September in Japan uh, to launch a coalition to stop crimes against humanity in North Korea, uh, bringing together different NGOs uh, from around the world, uh, South Korea, Japan, uh, uh, other parts of the Asia Pacific region, uh, North America, and, uh, <coughs> and Europe. Uh, to essentially launch which will be a sustained advocacy campaign to call for a UN Commission of Inquiry to examine human rights in North Korea. Because the big problem in North Korea, okay, is that 
everybody recognizes it's really one of the worst human rights abusing regimes in the world. But every time some sort of security incident comes up, you know, they start firing shells at an island or they shoot a missile over Japan, uh, it's like mysteriously the human rights agenda gets taken off the table. And everybody wants to talk about security and how do we get uh, Kim Jong il to sit down and be still and, and don't be a crazy man. Right? Um, the, the problem, however, is that if you look at what sustains the North Korean government, it's the fact that there is a rights abusing structure that is comprehensive and um, pervasive. So that, you know, it's not like if, if, if I defected to uh, South Korea, right, um, you know, all my brothers and sisters and my parents and everybody else would be able to send off to a labor camp. You know, it's not, you know, I did something and therefore everybody, it's just me. I mean, there, it, it's, it's, it's a principle of communal punishment where, you know, the, the, the like the old kings of, of yesteryear, you know, like, like, you know, I'm not going to kill you, but I'm going to kill every one of your relatives as well. You know, the same principle. And, you know, when you look at what happened in North Korea, for instance, only with the famine, in the mid 90s, and the famine that's actually happening again, and also the <clears throat> effective um, demonetization of the old North Korean won, which wiped out people's savings uh, two years ago. Um, people don't believe in Kim Jong il anymore. You know, um, people want, the problem is that people don't want to change things there, they just want to get out. Uh, so, you know, it, it's very interesting. You, you read testimonies of North Korean defectors, uh, people who managed to get to South Korea. And they're all basically saying, well, you know, Kim Il sung you know, the old man was okay, you know, he went through a lot, you know, he fought for the people. But his son, Kim Jong il, what an idiot. He's the one who's wrecked everything. And, and who's this little guy? Who's this son he's gonna bring? Kim Jong un? You know, I mean, you know, it's it frankly the the the, the Achilles heel of this regime is the fact that it's such a, a tremendous rights abuser. And it seems like everybody else is just talking past it or taking it off the table because uh, they're worried that um, there might be another irrational outburst. Uh, you know, this is something that um, uh, is no longer acceptable. So we're going to try to put the human rights uh, issue back on the North Korean agenda and keep it there uh, and make sure that people talk about it and make sure that ultimately at the end of the day, uh, even if North Korea doesn't want to cooperate with the Commission of Inquiry, that a Commission of Inquiry takes place. There's plenty of information outside of North Korea that, that, that could provide a damning indictment of, of that, that government's uh, abuses. Any questions? Yes. Um, like the, uh, listening to your answer just right now, um, there I came up with um, what do you think about the the Asian wisdom that but the uh, economic development has been improved like to some extent it, it will like um, trigger the democratization and the measurement of the, um, the people's rights. And um, like your the human rights strategy is pretty much kind of like it does, doesn't match with that concept and I'd like to know your reaction to like, do you have any like ideas to connect to that, or? I don't know. I mean, I'm not so sure. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, if you look, let's look at let's look at Burma. Um, I mean, Burma, Burma's had uh, a major. Burma's been gradually getting poorer, right? You know, ever since Ney Win, uh, you know, took over the government, established the BSPP in 1962, you know, nationalized everything, and basically things have been going downhill ever since. You know. And uh, you had 1988, uh, I think if you talk to the average Burmese, they said the situation in 1988 was probably better economically than what they face now, you know, in 2011. And, and we've continued to see unrest and, and people demanding their rights, um, you know, not only in, in, in 1988, but also the smaller versions of 1994, 1997. You know, Aung San Suu Kyi's motorcades or, or, or rallies in 2003, you know, uh, 
the Saffron Revolution in 2007. So I don't think that the aspirations of people to uh, basically be in control of their lives and not be afraid, you know, and to, to you know, advocate for their human rights or, you know, and, and that, I mean, that may not be a general issue. It might be like, like I don't have, not like I want to write something and that, that people, that, you know, or something that, that, but it might be like, you know, I don't want some uh, rich government connected person to come and take my land. Those things, those things aren't connected to the, the sort of level of, of, of poverty or, or the level of economic development. I mean, I, in fact, I would argue that there's sometimes other triggers. I mean, we're seeing this in Cambodia and Vietnam right now, where actually economic development is creating greater unrest, in part because it's opening opportunities for rapacious elites to seize land and property and other uh, things using political connections and connections to the military. Uh, but it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that uh, the people who are losing those things are better off. Um, you know, there there is, I think, Perhaps some areas where you could say, like, a, a person with means has more options. Um, you know, they could, for instance, have a computer so they can communicate with people uh, about their opposition to the government. But a person with more means also, at the same time, could just basically say, well, you know, I've got enough money, I'm out of here. So, you know, I don't, I think that each situation is a bit different. Um, I don't think that there's any sort of general rule of thumb in terms of you know, having to reach a certain level of development before people care about human rights and, 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 and advocate for democracy. Um, I think that there are there are possibilities that people with more resources have more options, and, and they can use them either productively or they can run away. Yes. Yeah. Well, how do you balance human rights and the culture? For example, talking about um, what I, what I want to mention is uh, the case that you are talking something to uh, Islamic countries, for example. Mm -hmm. they, they, these countries, as they believe <coughs> Islam, Muslim, they, they have a kind of culture of uh, looking down on women. women. Mm -hmm. I, I don't believe that, but looking down on women and mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, uh, you know, well, I don't know. Looking, looking down on women and uh, uh, restricting the women's human rights could be glorified as culture, but technically they could say so, and uh, I think there will be a kind of big fight. What's, uh, what's your discipline, or what is, what is your, you know? Well, I mean, it's a standpoint. Our standpoint, our standpoint is, uh, from, the, from the point of view of human rights, we're basically, we're universalists, you know, that we believe that Human rights are the same for each person. That uh, you know, the, all these human rights instruments that guide our work, uh, you know, is promulgated by the, the UN, you know, reflecting the will of the international community, and now becoming international, the customary international law. <coughs> um, these things all need to be respected. Um, so, for instance, like you know, talking about we're uh, uh, right now. I mean, we, we're we're very involved in this whole case of the woman who has been arrested for driving in Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, I mean, a very clear violation of her rights. Um, uh, I think, you know, the issue of culture and human rights, I mean, you know, it, it's easier for us to say that, you know, we, we basically come down on the side of human rights. Um, we argue against the kind of restrictions on women's rights that you're talking about. I mean, for instance, what we've been doing in Afghanistan, our greatest fear about Afghanistan right now is that um, as uh, people disengage from Afghanistan, it's basically going to throw the women's uh, rights right back into the hands of, of the warlords and others who, who have been restricted from the beginning. Now, <clears throat> on the issue of whether people should stay or go from Afghanistan in terms of you know the coalition forces and things like that. We don't really have a position on that. What we have a position on is what these people do when they're there in terms of, of, of respecting or not respecting human rights. Um, so I don't know. I mean, we work in so many different countries. On, on, so the issue of culture, we we allowed it to actually ensnare how we 
operationalize our belief in human rights within the gang. Or, um, <clears throat> I think sometimes we recognize that for an effective advocacy argument, we might uh, couch something in a different way. But the bottom line, in terms of uh, you know equality and, and, and respect for human rights across the board, same for all persons. We don't, we don't, we don't step back. Um, well, we've almost reached the end of our, of our allotted time. Um, do you want to conclude or? Uh, no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm fine. I mean, unless people want to, do people have any more questions? I'm happy to take one or two more. Sure. I, what, uh, maybe over the past few years or 10 years, what's been some of the success stories of your rights watch, either in Asia or globally, or even longer? Um, well, uh, we've had people, for instance, um, we're giving, tomorrow we're giving away our Alison Desforges award to a uh, human rights defender from Ethiopia. Alison Desforges was uh, our Rwanda researcher who died several years ago in a plane crash in upstate New York. Uh, very tragic. Um, but uh, she was someone who was uh, documenting atrocities in Rwanda starting in the, in the early 90s, late, actually even late 80s. Um, she was on the ground dealing with that as the Rwanda genocide was taking place. And, you know, she was a, a key expert witness in testifying just about every trial uh, in the Rwanda tribunals that was taking place. So, you know, <clears throat> when you look at, for instance, the International Criminal Court, um, We've been arguing for that for long before it was created. And in fact, I, I think what you see is a, as, a, as a trend to increasingly use the International Criminal Court. Now, sometimes it takes a period of time where, you know, uh, somebody who's got a deal to, to be eased out of power slowly loses credibility or is, is pushed aside, and finally somebody says, okay, well, we really do have a case against this person that needs to be sent to the court. Um, you know, and some of the people, Escape, you know, people like Idi Amin, you know, and them dying in uh, in Saudi Arabia. But the International Criminal Court, I think, has been a big success. Um, I would say that uh, in some discrete areas, for instance, like <coughs> increasing respect for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transsexual rights, been huge advances. Um, uh, in some countries in Southeast Asia, we deal with, like for instance, the Philippines. We're seeing improvements in part because uh, we've been pressing, for instance, on extrajudicial killings. Uh, so, you know, you're actually seeing more responsiveness from the, the Philippines government than the President Aquino about this. Um, I mean, I think that what we need to do, and this is, this is the most difficult thing, is, is we can work on cases, we can work on specific instances and like that, but what we have to try to do is achieve structural change. And structural change is really hard. Um, uh, you know, occasionally you get it. You know, so for instance, this year we were we were all involved in, in pushing for the new ILO convention on domestic workers that was just passed by the uh, uh, ILC in Geneva in this past June. Uh, a huge victory for domestic workers who have traditionally been and not considered workers have been left outside uh, provisions of labor law. And you know have been amongst the most exploited uh, migrant workers in, in, in the world. Um, so you know we push for those things while we deal with specific cases, and uh, we try to always sort of um, build up a case for something that will that will that will last. Uh, you know if we get a commission, if we got we we I'll, I'll give you another example. The the panel of experts on Sri Lanka uh, that was chaired by Marzuki Darusman from, from, from Indonesia, which came out with a highly damning report. Um, we, in, the, in getting that, we reversed uh, a basic drubbing that we took at the UN Human Rights Council the year before, where we pushed for a special session on Sri Lanka. We were outmaneuvered by the governments, by Sri Lanka, by the uh, non-aligned movement uh, by the Chinese and others. And 
essentially we got sent sent home uh, with our tail behind our legs, between our legs. We just got we just got hammered. Uh, you know, everything that could have gone wrong with the UN Human Rights Council went wrong in that instance. And to turn that around in a year and now have uh, Roger Paksa and uh, his government on their back foot, you know, facing, you know, they're trying to hold that 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 experts report and prevent it from becoming a, a, a formal UN document because they recognize that it could be a predecessor to a commission of inquiry, it could be a predecessor to some sort of uh, larger action against them because it's, it's pretty clear that <clears throat> at the end of the civil war in, in, in Sri Lanka there were crimes against humanity committed by the, by the, by the Sri Lankan army. You know, there was a, there was a ITN channel for um, uh, special that was shown, I think, two or three weeks ago. You know, basically has, you know, people being shot dead by soldiers. You know, people testifying that, you know, the ICRC was going into a no-fire zone that had been declared by the government into the hospital. And the ICRC, when they do that, they go in and they will basically check the situation, they'll provide supplies, whatever they can. They will also do a GPS coordinate of where the hospital is, basically mark it, and they will give that information to the government to basically say, don't shoot here. Well, within a half an hour after the ICRC people left, and this happened several different times, all of a sudden, a bunch of Sri Lankan government shells came right into the middle of the hospital. It was deliberate targeting, to the point where actually the Sri Lankan Tamil doctors who are assisting these people in, in these horrific conditions asked IRC, please don't give the coordinates of where we are. They'll just kill us. So you had shelling hospitals in no fire zones declared by the government. So I mean <clears throat> so I mean we, we occasionally we can turn things around. And so occasionally sometimes like Burma, we just bang our head against the wall year in and year out. <laughs> okay, well, good to thank you again, again, so Blackboard. blackboard. Uh, th thank you very much. Yes. I think we could go on our YouTube channel as well. Great, thanks. So, thanks again. Um, if you, again, if you didn't get an email from us, you give me your, your card and you can always put some money in our contribution box. It looks like a ballot box, but it's not. Fine okay. Yeah, no, we, we're, we're selling books. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you.